Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. So Seneca is a Stoic philosopher. Um, this is literally a letters collection, and usually those are very much like bedtime books for me. Uh, if not, I read them a little bit at a time before bed. But this one actually was super absorbing, so I read it as my main book. I've got a load of tabs, so I'll uh, check those out in a minute. As always, first of all, I'm going to read you the blurb, then we'll um, dive on in. So, Dane reads... For several years of his turbulent life, in which he was dogged by ill health, exile and political danger, Seneca, 4 BC to AD 65, was the guiding hand of the Roman Empire. His inspiring reasoning derived mainly from the Stoic principles, which had originally been developed some centuries earlier in Athens. This selection of Seneca's letters shows him upholding the austere ethical ideals of Stoicism, the wisdom of the self-possessed person immune to overmastering emotions and life setbacks, while valuing friendship and the courage of ordinary men, and criticising the harsh treatment of slaves and the cruelties in the gladiatorial arena. The humanity and wit revealed in Seneca's interpretation of Stoicism is a moving and inspiring declaration of the dignity of the individual mind. Robin Campbell's translation captures Seneca's humour and tautly aphoristic style. His introduction and notes discuss the tension between a philosopher's principles and his acquisition of wealth and his role in advising the increasingly wayward and tyrannical emperor Nero. So, it's kind of like historically significant as well. And it's said that Seneca probably even though these are written as letters he probably wrote it with the idea that they were all going to be published as a collection of letters you know and like this is quite dark he had uh, he wasn't a healthy man so it says uh, this is in the introduction Seneca suffered severely from ill health particularly asthma throughout his life he tells us that at one time the only thing which held him back from committing suicide was the thought of his father's inability to bear the loss and um, also, again, he's not like he's not held up as being the perfect guy. So it says, Seneca himself, we observe, occasionally makes immodest statements concerning his own progress, but is capable of humility, as in one description of himself as a long way from being a tolerable, let alone a perfect human being. So a guy called Macaulay, I don't know who this is, but he says, there is Macaulay's celebrated statement in a letter to a friend. I cannot bear Seneca. His works are made up of mottos. There is hardly a sentence which might not be quoted, but to read him straightforward is like dining on nothing but anchovy sauce. Um, I agree there are a lot of mottos, which is why there are so many tabs for me to go through. Um, but I don't know about the anchovy sauce thing, because I'm vegan, I don't have an anchovy sauce. And there's a great quote here uh, from the preface and postscript to the anthology Seneca's Morals by Way of Abstract, published by Sir Roger Lestrange in 1673. He says, books and dishes have this common fate. There was never any one of either of them that pleased all palates. So uh, we'll start here with, uh, this is mostly just going to be me reading stuff because I think a lot of it is self-explanatory. I, I think maybe part of this is the credit of the translators as well who made this so readable, you know. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is from letter two. It says... Um, be careful, however, that there is no element of discursiveness and desultoriness about this reading you refer to, this reading of many different authors and books of every description. You should be extending your stay among writers whose genius is unquestionable, deriving constant nourishment from them if you wish to gain anything from your reading that will find a lasting place in your mind. To be everywhere is to be nowhere. People who spend their whole life travelling abroad end up having plenty of places where they can find hospitality, but no real friendships. The same must needs be the case with people who never set about acquiring an intimate acquaintanceship with any one great writer, but but skip from one to another, paying flying visits to them all. All right, bit of a change of scenery. I'm in my old bedroom at my mum's house. Um, so you're gonna have to put up with this. I'm afraid I don't have any lighting. I have, do have, oh, a lamp there, but it's not plugged in. So you're just gonna have to, have to deal with this. So where were we? So again, another little aphorism that I thought was great. Trusting everyone is as much a fault as trusting no one. Though I should call the first the worthier and the second the safer behavior. And he gets some advice here, um, which I don't think I follow, especially the bits about shabbiness. So he says, uh, letter number five. I view with pleasure and approval the way you keep on at your studies and sacrifice everything to your single-minded efforts to make yourself every day a better man. I do not merely urge you to persevere in this. I actually implore you to. Let me give you, though, this one piece of advice. Refrain from following the example of those whose craving is for attention, not their own improvement, by doing certain things which are calculated to give rise to comment on your appearance or way of living generally. Avoid shabby attire, long hair, an unkempt beard, an outspoken dislike of silverware, sleeping on the ground and all other misguided means of self-advertisement. The very name of philosophy, however modest the manner in which it is pursued, is unpopular enough as it is. Imagine what the reaction would be if we started dissociating ourselves from the conventions of society. Inwardly, everything should be different, but our outward face should conform with the crowd. 
Our clothes should not be gaudy, yet they should not be dowdy either. We should not keep silver plate with inlays of solid gold. But at the same time, we should not imagine that doing without gold and silver is proof that we are leading the simple life. Let our aim be a way of life not diametrically opposed to, but better than that of the mob. Otherwise, we shall repel and alienate the very people whose reform we desire. We shall make them, moreover, reluctant to imitate us in anything for fear that they may have to imitate us in everything. The first thing philosophy promises us is the feeling of fellowship, of belonging to mankind and being members of a community. Being different will mean the abandoning of that manifesto. We must watch that the means by which we hope to gain admiration do not earn ridicule and hostility. Our motto, as everyone knows, is to live in conformity with nature. It is quite contrary to nature to torture one's body, to reject simple standards of cleanliness and make a point of being dirty, to adopt a diet that is not just plain but hideous and revolting. In the same way as a craving for dainties is a token of extravagant living, avoidance of familiar and inexpensive dishes betokens insanity. Philosophy calls for simple living, not for doing penance, and the simple way of life need not be a crude one. The standard which I accept is this. One's life should be a compromise between the ideal and the popular morality. People should admire our way of life, but they should at the same time find it understandable. And so I just thought this was another interesting little excerpt from the start of letter seven. You asked me to say what you should consider it particularly important to avoid. My answer is this, a mass crowd. It is something to which you cannot entrust yourself yet without risk. I, at any rate, am ready to confess my own frailty in this respect. I never come back home with quite the same moral character I went out with. Something or other becomes unsettled where I had achieved internal peace. Some one or other of the things I had put to flight reappears on the scene. We who are recovering from a prolonged spiritual sickness are in the same condition as invalids who have been affected to such an extent by prolonged indis indisposition that they cannot once be taken out of doors without ill effects. Associating with people in large numbers is actually harmful. There is not one of them that will not make some vice or other attractive to us, or leave us carrying the imprint of it, or bedaubed all unawares with it. And inevitably enough, the larger the size of the crowd we mingle with, the greater the danger. But nothing is as ruinous to the character as sitting away one's time at a show, for it is then, through the medium of entertainment, that vices creep into one with more than usual ease. Mm. So this is from letter CVIII, uh, 108. So he talks about um, sort of abstinence, I guess. Um, so he's talking about Attalus, he says, when he started exposing our pleasures and commending to us, along with moderation in our diet, physical purity and a mind equally uncontaminated, uncontaminated not only by illicit pleasures but by unnecessary ones as well, I would become enthusiastic about keeping the appetites for food and drink firmly in their place, with the result that some of this, Lucidius, has lasted with me right through life. For I started out on it all with tremendous energy and enthusiasm, and later, after my return to public life, I managed to retain a few of the principles as regards which I had made this promising beginning. This is how I came to give up oysters and mushrooms for the rest of my life, for they are not really food to us, but titbits which induce people who have already had as much as they can take to go on eating, the object most desired by gluttons and others who stuff themselves with more than they can hold, being items which will come up again as easily as they go down. This too is why throughout life I have always abstained from using scent, as the best smell a body can have is no smell at all. This is why no wine ever finds its way into my stomach. This is the reason for my lifelong avoidance of hot baths, believing as I do that it is effeminate as well as pointless to stew one's body and exhaust it with continual sweating. Some other things to which I once said goodbye have made their reappearance, but nevertheless in these cases in which I have ceased to practice total abstinence, I succeed in observing a limit, which is something hardly more than a step removed from total abstinence, and, per and even perhaps more difficult, with some things less effort of will is required to cut them out altogether than to have recourse to them in moderation. It makes me think of cigarettes, it's easy just to completely quit them. And then this here from letter 122. Um, <laughs> So I actually posted this on Instagram because I'm a notorious night owl and he wrote The daylight has begun to diminish. It has contracted considerably, but not so much that there is not a generous amount remaining still for anyone who will, so to speak, rise with the daylight itself. More active and commendable still is the person who is waiting for the daylight and intercepts the first rays of the sun. Shame on him who lies in bed dozing when the sun is high in the sky, whose waking hours commence in the middle of the day, and even this time for a lot of people is the equivalent of the small hours. There are some who invert the functions of day and night and do not separate eyelids leaden with the previous day's carousal before night sets in. Their way of life, if not their geographical situation, resembles the state of those peoples whom nature, as Virgil says, has planted beneath our feet on the opposite side of the world. So it says, um, somebody quoted, in Aubrey's Lives, he wrote, Dr. Kettle was wont to say that Seneca writes as a boar does piss. 
by jerks. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to share with you guys from Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in it that's very quotable. A lot of stuff that was like food for thought. It's not necessarily like a guide to living. Um, and it's not as though I'm gonna go off and try, and to, try to live my life like Seneca did. Um, and actually that's not what he would have wanted based on his own writings, but definitely um, really interesting stuff. As I say, it's good just stuff to kind of chew over in your mind and decide whether you agree with it or not and see what's relevant to our lives, what isn't so relevant. Uh, I gave this a four out of five because I thought it was super interesting. Would recommend Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. So there we have it, that's what I made of Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.